We are in record. Victoria, you are good to go. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's so nice to be with y'all and to meet you. My name is Victoria Beeler, and I'm a butterfly enthusiast. So my family and I, we live in at, near Atlanta, Georgia, and we have raised and released monarch butterflies for the first time last fall in our garden at home. And so tonight I'll be sharing with you about my experience with Journey with Monarchs, a personal experience of raising and releasing monarchs in the home garden. So how my family and I got started with butterflies is we've always had a passion for butterflies and growing up I've always loved butterflies and a few years ago, my family and I found a local garden called the Smith Gilbert Gardens in Kennesaw, Georgia. And we volunteered there and they had a butterfly house there called Garden with Wings. And it was there where we learned so much about the butterflies because there were so many types of species there. And we learned about host plants and nectar plants. And a host plant is what butterfly females lay eggs on and what the caterpillars eat the leaves. So it's a food source for the caterpillars. And then the nectar plants are nectar sources for the adult butterflies. So my family and I also consulted with local gardens and native plant nurseries to better inform us on how to have a butterfly garden to create a habitat for them. And then also last year, I really enjoyed learning about birds, butterflies, pollinators, wildlife and gardening through the Audubon Society, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, the World Migratory Bird Day in the Americas, as well as a local master gardeners group. So these were all virtual webinars that I was able to be a part of for free and it's open to anyone and no membership or local in-state residence is required. So importantly, the best thing was noticing and appreciating the wonders in my backyard at home. I've learned so much just from observing the kinds of butterflies, the birds, the bees, everything. And it's been so fun trying to find out what kinds they are and what they really like. And other helpful resources that my family and I have used are Monarch Watch, Monarch Joint Venture, Journey North, Save Our Monarchs, the Mr. Lund Science YouTube channel, the Stokes Butterfly Book, which is my favorite, and it's a guide to butterfly gardening, identification, and behavior, as well as Doug Tallamy's Bringing Nature Home, How We Can Sustain Wildlife with Native Plants. And through this incredible experience of raising and releasing monarchs in the home garden, I, I've been so inspired that I've written a book about monarchs called Journey with Monarchs, and it's just amazing. It, I, I've enjoyed sharing about the monarchs in my book, and it shows photos of the monarchs' life stages and and all of their different, how they, their host plants, their nectar plants, and then I also incorporate my personal knowledge and observations with the science and how we can help them. So it's been amazing just seeing the monarchs in our home garden last year and raising them. So information about monarchs. Monarchs are mostly found in North America and Mexico, and they are the only butterfly species known to make a two-way migration like birds and they're declining due to habitat loss and loss of milkweed, which is monarch's only host plant. And native nectar sources for butterflies include purple coneflowers, black-eyed Susans, and mountain mint. And these are great for pollinators too. So how we can help the monarchs is by planting native milkweeds like swamp milkweed and butterfly weed. And these are native to Georgia, and they're also native throughout the United States. 
and by also planting butterfly nectar plants, which are the nectar sources. And when we create these native pollinator and wildlife gardens in our backyards, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. It can be very practical and it can even be in containers. And it's creating a habitat or a refuge for different species to be able to continue their life cycles. And that also is a great way um, to promote conservation. And then by having butterfly gardens, it provides like patches or nectaring stopovers where butterflies, when they're migrating, for instance, when monarchs are on their migratory journeys to Mexico in the fall, it's really important that we have butterfly gardens, um, flowers and plants that attract the butterflies so that they can fuel up for their migratory journeys. And then also raising and releasing a few monarchs at home in an outdoor butterfly habitat is educational and it offers the butterflies protection so they can thrive and continue their life cycle. So let's spread joy to all and continue the monarch's legacy by planting native milkweed and by creating wildlife backyard habitats benefiting all creatures in the ecosystem. So tonight I'll be sharing with you about the monarch butterfly significance and their different life stages. For example, the butterflies have four main life stages, the egg, caterpillar, chrysalis, and emerging butterfly. And within the caterpillar phase, there are instars, and I'll talk with you in a minute about that. And then um, release and meeting the monarchs in our home garden. And then invitation, monarch resources, and questions. So monarch butterfly significance, Dr. Fred and Nora Urquhart, who were monarch biologists, and Ken Brug Brugger and Catalina Aguado, who were monarch citizen science tagging volunteers, discovered overwintering monarchs from North America and Mexico in 1976. Mm -hmm. And citizen science is a great way that anyone in the community can help scientists know more about the butterflies or any type of species and it's really helping the scientists collect data and collect information so that we can better help our ecosystem. And so monarch butterflies have a fall migration, but what's really unique is that there are fourth generation monarchs and they are called the super migration generation or the Methuselah generation. And they are the ones that are born late summer to early fall. And those are the butterflies that will live eight to nine months and migrate to central Mexico in the fall on a 3000 mile journey and overwinter or hibernate there in the Oimo fir tree forest in the Sierra Madre mountains and then return here in the spring to breed and continue the life cycle. So the monarchs that my family and I raised and released in our home garden last year were fourth generation monarchs. And then in the spring, each monarch, they start waking up out of hibernation in February. And then in March, they start being reproductive and laying eggs. And then they pass away. But their offspring, the new first generation, they are the ones that start the journey north to North America in the spring. So amazingly, it takes three to four monarch generations to fully reach North America. So this year's fourth generation monarchs are the great, great grandchildren of last year's fourth generation monarchs. So it's an incredible multi-generation journey. And some Eastern monarch populations are non-migratory, such as those in Southern Florida, where they there's a continuous supply of milkweed throughout the year and nectar plants. And then there are also what's called Western monarchs. And those are the monarchs that are west of the Rocky Mountains and they migrate to coastal California for the winter. 
So these are the monarch butterflies in our home garden. You can see that we have swamp milkweed plants and which is a host plant for the monarch butterfly. And then we also have all the flowers, the nectar plants. And then we have trees in our backyard as well, like some native trees that support birds as well. So monarch butterflies host the nectar plants. The monarch's exclusive host plant is milkweed. And my family and I use swamp milkweed and its scientific name is called Asclepias incarnata. And then we use nectar plants, which are nectar sources for adult butterflies. And these include purple coneflowers, black-eyed Susans, and mountain mint. So stage one egg. So this is a monarch female butterfly that laid her eggs on our swamp milkweed plants in our garden last year. And I call her Mother Monarch because she's the one that gave us all the wonderful monarch butterflies ultimately. So a female monarch butterfly lays her eggs on the milkweed plants. Usually it's on the underside of a leaf. However, she can also lay it near the seed pods and she lays one egg at a time, but can lay many eggs in a day and up to 400 eggs in her lifetime, which is usually up to five weeks. So that's true for most butterflies. Most butterflies usually live up to five weeks but the migration generation monarchs who live up to eight to nine months. So that's amazing. And you can see that this is a monarch egg right here on a milkweed leaf in our garden. It is the size of a pinhead and it's oval shaped and it has ridges and it can be either like white, cream colored or yellow. And then the, this is the outdoor butterfly habitat that my grandpa built in my garden at home. So he used he used um, PVC pipes and mosquito netting, and it was probably about four feet tall by four feet wide, so we could walk into it. And he made it backless so that he mounted it onto the windows of the house so that we could view the process from indoors or through outside by walking into the butterfly house. So what we did was when we noticed the monarch female butterflies laying the eggs on the milkweed plants, then we moved those plants. We had them planted in big 15 gallon size nursery containers and we put them on a dolly cart and then we moved the milkweed plants into our outdoor butterfly house so that the eggs could hatch in a safe place away from predators like birds, lizards, ants, and wasps. And then we, um, we, then the eggs hatch into caterpillars and then they ultimately turn into chrysalis and then into butterflies. So stage two, caterpillar first instar. So monarch caterpillars go through five instars, which are stages of development. And these are the stages between molts. So as they grow, they shed their outer layer of skin, their exoskeleton, which is basically um, something that encases their soft bodies and protects their organs. So uniquely, Monarch caterpillars and all caterpillars are invertebrates, which means that they don't have a backbone like we do. So because of that, they have to shed their skin every time they grow and get bigger. So this process is called molting. So the caterpillars will molt five times and then their egg hatches in three to four days. And a caterpillar, which is also called a larva, emerges by breaking through the egg and eating some of the eggshell, which is called the chorion. And then it comes out and starts eating on the milkweed leaf, which contains toxins. And those toxins are called cardinalides. So when the monarch caterpillar ingests those milkweed leaves, it also becomes poisonous. So then if a bird tries to eat a monarch caterpillar, it'll learn not to mess with them anymore. And so amazingly, the caterpillar phase takes about two weeks. And during this time, a monarch caterpillar will only eat solid food, milkweed. It will not eat liquid. But when it becomes a butterfly, the butterfly will only ingest liquid, nectar. 
So when the monarch caterpillar ingests milkweed, it stores these toxins to make itself poisonous as a chemical defense mechanism so that it'll protect itself better from predators like birds. And then monarchs, so milkweed is um, poisonous to humans and animals, but monarchs have adapted to tolerate these toxins. And the monarch caterpillar will be gray at first, and then it will become, um, have stripes, and the stripes will become more defined. So here are some newly hatched caterpillars, some monarch caterpillars in our home garden. So here's a baby monarch caterpillar. You can see it just hatched out of its eggshell. And right before the caterpillar is going to hatch from the egg, the eggshell will start turning black. And that is the caterpillar's head as it's trying to come through the eggshell. Then the caterpillar will come out of the egg and it will start kind of munching some on the milkweed leaf. And you can see that it'll be kind of translucent at first and then it'll have um, clear becoming having more stripes on it. And then you can start really noticing those yellow, black and white stripes and it's antennae, which are called filaments at the front and rear. So stage two, caterpillar second and star. So now monarch caterpillars have a round black head at this larval stage. And it's really amazing because when monarch caterpillars are half an inch long, they're already developing their adult butterfly parts inside like their wings. So these adult butterfly cells are called imaginal discs. And that's what will tr help transform the caterpillar into a butterfly. And you can see that its head is almost like a, a, a little black button and it has um, filaments at the front and back. So stage two, caterpillar third and star. So the monarch caterpillar's filaments or antennae at the front and back are growing longer and its false legs, its pro legs are noticed as well. And on the bottom, on the tips of the pro legs are little suction cups or gripping hooks that the caterpillar uses to hold on to a leaf or to its silk mat. And those little gripping hooks are called crotchets. And so the front of the caterpillar is the end with the longest filaments, the longest antennae. And you can see that um, the head has a black and white triangle and it's almost like a mask. So every time the caterpillar will molt, it'll shed its skin and it'll its head capsule, it'll also come off like a mask. And it's really amazing. Now we're at the fourth end star. So monarch caterpillars have just molted, they shed their skin, and this molting process takes about three hours um, for each time. And they probably molt about, they molt five times, and I would say they probably do this every few days, like maybe every three to four days. So then you can see that this top photo is a an old exoskeleton so that is literally the caterpillar's old skin. And it's like they step out of their old suit and put on a new one. So the new fourth and star caterpillar is growing rapidly and it must consume enough milkweed to support its future life in the chrysalis, which is the upcoming pupil stage of development. And then the caterpillar is very delicate after molting and is very wet. So it's very vulnerable. And it takes a few hours for the new skin to bond to the caterpillar. So that usually takes about an hour. So in this photo, you can see that the the stripes at the fourth end star are very broad, more defined. It's got yellow, black, and white stripes. And down the middle of its back are these dark black spots. Those That is its equivalent of a heart and it's called the dorsal vessel. So it functions like a heart. And it also has ostea, which are valves. And what's interesting is that um, caterpillars have an open circulatory system where all their blood is contained in a special cavity called the hemocell. But humans, we have 
a closed circulatory system where all our blood is contained in arteries and veins. So that's very interesting. And all of these little caterpillars, well, all these growing caterpillars, they are just really growing. They're shedding their skin. And it's also amazing because you can see this black mat behind them as their old exoskeleton. And you can really see their pro legs, which are the false legs that are used for locomotion. You can really see those crotchets, which are the suction cups that are used to grip onto the, the leaf there. And its head capsule will be clear at first after it sheds its skin, and then it will start becoming darker. And you see those dark black spots down the back? That is its, um, its equivalent of the heart, the dorsal vessel. And see how long the filaments are at the front and back? So, so it's really growing. Now we've made it. We're at the fifth end star, and this is the final phase as a caterpillar. So monarch caterpillars have grown 3,000 times in size since hatching from their eggs, and they're very long and baggy now with broad stripes and curling filaments, and they have built-in adult butterfly cells, which are called imaginal discs, and those that's what the, butter, the caterpillar uses to become a butterfly. So the butterfly, the caterpillars don't have lungs like we do, and neither do butterflies. So what they use is called spiracles. And spiracles are these nine small black openings, which can be noticed in the caterpillar sides. So above every leg there, every pro leg is a little opening or portal, and that's called a spiracle. That's how the caterpillars obtain oxygen for breathing. And then monarch caterpillars have enzymes and um, hormones. Um, so when their hormones um, are communicating, sending signals through their body at the fifth end star, so basically they've maxed out on milkweed at this point, and now they stop eating milkweed and start wandering to form a place for their chrysalis. And so here is a fifth end star monarch caterpillar wandering up a beam, a support beam in the butterfly habitat, getting ready to form its chrysalis. So when a monarch caterpillar finds a place to form its chrysalis, it will hang upside down in a J position. And this is called hanging in J. So basically it hangs upside down because it uses gravity so that when it becomes a butterfly, if when it's hanging upside down as it emerges from the chrysalis, it dry that helps the butterfly dry its wings better. So uh, basically, a chrysalis, um, a caterpillar's exoskeleton is the covering of the creature, the monarch inside. So inside that chrysalis is a living creature, and with complex organization and function. And the monarch is rearranging its body parts inside of its exoskeleton in preparation for the transition. And it will hang in J for up to 18 hours before it, before it forms a chrysalis, depending on the weather. It could be um, sooner in warmer temperatures or cooler and sooner in a, a shorter. I'm sorry, it can be um, longer and um, cooler temperatures and shorter and warm temperatures. So a hint of green can be noticed behind the caterpillar's head, and that's those special enzymes that the monarch uses to become a chrysalis. And basically, the the chrysalis is um, another word for that is called pupa. So it's a butterfly pupa, and that's basically the developmental mummy-like stage just before the final adult stage. So it's preparing to transform into a butterfly. So the butterflies, the monarch's juvenile hormones are rising, and it goes to the corpora allata. And the enzymes are helping the, the caterpillar, the, the creature, transform into a chrysalis and ultimately a butterfly. So now you can see that this is a monarch caterpillar hanging upside down in J in our home garden. And what it does is you can see this little green, a hint of green at its thorax. So every insect has three main body parts, the head, thorax, and abdomen. 
So this hint of green can be noticed at the thorax region. And you see this little thick wad of silk up there at the leaf? That is how it, it spins silk. So what's unique is it has a silk producing organ under its head called the spinneret. And it shoots the silk up there and it attaches its back pro legs to the leaf and it hangs upside down in J. And so now stage three chrysalis. So now a green shell is appearing underneath the old monarch's exoskeleton and the monarch is splitting its skin. So you can see a line going down the side of the of the caterpillar there as the the chrysalis is coming up. And that is where the it, it's splitting its skin and its filaments, its antennae will literally shrivel up. And what the caterpillar is trying to do is as this green internal substance is coming out through its skin, it's pushing up the last um part the last molt which is the fifth molt you can see that old exoskeleton the old caterpillar skin kind of crumpled up there at the top and so in the chrysalis the monarch will recycle all of its insides and transform into a new form so it basically rearranges itself and puts itself back together like a puzzle and it's really amazing how this transformation takes place. So this is going to be the, the last molt, the fifth molt. So the monarch is now a chrysalis and it's wiggling around trying to tie everything up. And the chrysalis is the new monarch forms exoskeleton. So it's now completely shed its old skin for the last time. So the monarch drops its old exoskeleton remains and hangs from the leaf in this case, having become a chrysalis within seconds. So you can see this is the last, um, the fifth molt. Um, you can see that that's the old caterpillar remains right there. And what the chrysalis is attached to the leaf with a special stick-like appendage called the cremaster. So it literally has to jab that cremaster into the silk button, the silk mat on the leaf. And that cremaster is like the lifeline for the monarch caterpillar. So if, in other words, if the monarch chrysalis is not able to insert that cremaster into this um, the silk button there, then it could be fatal. So you see these little black dots on the sides of the chrysalis there on the left photo? Well, that was literally, I could see the cat caterpillar or the monarch inside breathing um, or doing something. So that was so cool that something in there was literally pulsing. And because monarchs and other um, insects like that, they don't have lungs, so they have spiracles. So in the right photo, you can see kind of there are like little openings on the side there. And those are how it obtains oxygen, um, how it kind of like breathes, so to speak. And it'll kind of be really wet and like a beehive-like shape. And then it'll solidify within about 24 hours. So here is the monarch chrysalis and it's very soft and wet right now. And then the front of the chrysalis is the bottom right photo, which is the side with the six black dots near the cremaster, the stick-like appendage. And then the back of the chrysalis is the bottom left photo with the little black step at the top. And that's called the holdfast tubercle. And that's what the monarch caterpillar used to hold on to with its last set of prolegs before fully turning into a chrysalis. And then now the monarch chrysalis is dry, compact, and solidified. And it's camouflaged for protection to resemble a leaf. And it's called a monarch because it has a gold crown. So it's not real gold, but it's it's used to resemble gold. It's metallic looking dots that reflect sunlight. And those are from special pigments that were acquired from the monarch's milky diet as a caterpillar. So those carotenoids are what kind of give that 
uh, raised diadem structure. And then you can see how it looks like kind of a leaf. And so then the monarch chrysalis phase will last about two weeks. And it could be shorter if it's cooler, I mean, warmer or longer if it's cooler. And then you can also start to see many butterfly parts, such as the wings, eyes, head, and filaments. And you can also notice if it's a female or a male. So in this middle photo, you can see that near the top, near the six black dots, um, near the cremaster, so under those six black dots, there's a little indention, and that indicates that it's a female. And then on the bottom right photo is a little blank segment there under those six black dots near the cremaster, so that indicates that it's a male. Now the bottom left photo shows you can start to see the monarch's wings forming um, on the side of the chrysalis there. So as the monarch prepares to emerge from the chrysalis, the chrysalis will become translucent. So the chrysalis itself will turn from green to clear. And then the butterfly inside is what makes the chrysalis have look dark. And you can really start to see the monarch butterfly forming inside. So it's really cool. And it takes about when the chrysalis turns clear, that means that the butterfly is getting ready to emerge and it'll be within 24 hours. So there's this little section, what I call the triangle section. And it's basically the part where the monarch butterfly will break open first when it emerges. So that little triangle section is, and keep in mind that the monarch butterfly is upside down in that chrysalis. So at the bottom of that triangle section is its head. And then it has eyes and its proboscis, which is its curly tongue or mouth part. And then it has um, legs, six true legs. And then it has um, its wings. And color pigments are one of the last things to be added to the monarch's wings and then you can really just see it developing inside it's so beautiful and now the monarch butterfly is emerging and it will have completed its metamorphosis or transformation so the whole process from egg caterpillar chrysalis and then butterfly is about four weeks so the cat the butterfly will break open the triangle section and by um, breaking open the triangle section first, and then the head will come out, and then its abdomen, and then its filaments, and then it will literally piece together its proboscis, its curly tongue, and its proboscis will be like in two parts, and it literally has to zip it up, like assemble it, and make it one, and then emergence from the chrysalis takes about five minutes, so the monarch butterfly's wings will be very soft and roughly at first, and they may need about two to three hours to fully dry. So the monarch butterfly pumps um, hemolymph, which is the insect equivalent of blood, through its body to its wings, and this inflates the wings and gives the wings strength. And then um, within about two to three hours, the monarch butterfly's wings will be dry and they will deflate and flatten out. So here are the emerging monarch butterflies in our garden. We've made it. <laughs> so the butterfly is um, emerging from its chrysalis. You can see how it slides down and it pops out its abdomen, unfurls its filaments and antennae. And then it also uh, pieces together its uh, mouth parts, its proboscis, and then the wings are really roughly, and then they'll flatten out. And then it flies away from its chrysalis and leaving behind its old shell. So the male monarch butterfly has two scent scales, which are dark spots on their bottom wings. And these release mating chemicals perfume called pheromones to attract a female mate. And female butterflies don't have that those spots, but they do have wider, more defined wing veins, so they don't have scent scales like the males. 
But importantly, this generation of monarchs, the fourth migration, fourth generation monarchs, they are born late summer, early fall, and they're not reproductive at this time in the fall. So they're on reproductive diapause because they're the ones that will migrate to Mexico and overwinter there and then become reproductive in the spring, breed and lay eggs. And then they start a new generation and their offspring will begin the spring migration to North America. And then here's a female monarch butterfly on the bottom left photo. And you can see how she has seemingly larger um, wing veins there. And then the male has two black spots, a black spot in each hind wing. And those are called also called andraconia wing scales, which is basically it, how it um, releases the perfume. And so then um, butterflies fly best in warm air temperatures above 70 degrees Fahrenheit and when it's really sunny. And butterflies use special sensory organs on their legs called tarsi to detect the presence of sugar and their host plants. And they are a part of the insect order Lepidoptera, which means insects with scaly wings, including moths. And their wing scales have internal structures um, that reflect light, giving the wings color. And their wings also store toxins. So what's really amazing is that when the monarch was a caterpillar, remember how it ate milkweed and how the milkweed was poisonous? Well, the monarch caterpillar then was also poisonous. So those same poisons were still active and present all the way through the adult butterfly stage. So the adult monarch butterfly is also poisonous and it also has bright wing coloration to warn predators to stay away. It also has um, eye spots, which are like false eyes on its wings to make itself appear like it's really scary, like an owl or a bat. And these are again, the fourth generation monarchs. They have larger forewings than the previous monarch generations. And their larger forewings are intended for their long distance flights. And also the fourth generation monarchs fly in a more focused, directed southwesterly direction towards the sun. So when on their journey to Mexico, they fuel up on nectar and they use their internal compass, which is located in their filaments and their antennae and then they also use the position of the sun and the earth's magnetic field, as well as land features, air currents and thermals to glide on and social cues and collective information sharing. So, and then they also may take a brief rest from flying at nectaring stopovers, like when we have butterfly gardens. And then um, there are three main migratory flyways in the US, by the way, and the main one is in Texas. And so it's really important to have butterfly gardens, um, to have host plants and nectar plants that support all of these um, species. And then, so then the monarchs, um, it takes the migration generation monarchs about two months to get to Mexico. Then they usually get, they start leaving in October and then they get there in December. Then they start forming colonies and they roost in oymal fir trees which can be 12,000 feet above sea level. And they go in the Sierra Madre Mountains at the Monarch Butterfly Biosphere Reserve in Michoacan, Mexico. And it's really interesting because the Monarch's fall arrival represents in Mexican culture, the souls of ancestors and coincides with Dia de los Muertos, which is a celebration of those who have passed. And in the spring, the Monarchs and their offspring start the return journey north. It's really also amazing because monarchs and other butterflies have two hearts. So they have a dorsal vessel, which is like their main heart in their thorax and in their abdomen. And then they also have a wing heart in each wing. And this helps to control blood flow, hemolymph, which is the insect equivalent of blood. So basically, new scientific research using luminous infrared images has found that there is a what's thought of as a wing heart in each wing and that each wing is made up of a network of living cells so it's very amazing and then 
These are the emerging butterflies in our garden. So these are the monarch butterflies. They're so happy and they're flying around in the outdoor butterfly house. And then the monarch butterflies have compound eyes and they can see better than when they were caterpillars. And they can also see UV colors. It's really cool because plants also have UV colors and they use air vibrations and ultrasounds to detect sound and they use their filaments to detect smell in their surroundings and they can absorb nectar, water, muddy soil for minerals and tree sap with their proboscis, their curly tongue, and then they curl it under when not in use. And they balance with a special organ below their filaments called the Johnston's organ that detects wind and gravity and flight. And there are butterfly and moth distinctions. So it's really amazing how butterflies and moths are both pollinators. However, butterflies have smooth filaments with knobs at the tips, and they're usually, they usually have smoother midsections, are active during the day, and they use the sun to navigate. They also perch while nectaring, and they have usually brighter wing coloration. Moths, on the other hand, have feathery filaments and fuzzier midsections and are mostly active at night, so they use the moon to navigate, and they hover while nectaring, and then they have wings that are connected by a wing hooking system called the frenulum, and they usually have duller wing coloration. It's important to note that we need to consider dimming artificial lights at night, such as outdoor lights, because this helps moths and birds orient themselves naturally with natural light from the moon. So by dimming our artificial lights or turning them off, we can help um, birds as well that may be migrating um, have a safe passage and to orient themselves naturally with the moonlight. And Butterflies and moths are both pollinators, so no flowers, no butterflies, and no milkweed, no monarchs, so they are essential. And here is a monarch butterfly and an oak beauty moth in the garden at home, and you can note the differences. So the monarch butterfly has more smooth filaments and tenai and um, a smoother midsection and um, and then the brighter wing coloration and the moth on the other hand has feathery filaments and usually duller coloration. And again, monarch butterflies are really special because they're the only known butterfly species to make a two-way migration. And then um, it's important to note that there are some other moths and butterflies that do migrate. Some butterflies that also migrate are the painted lady, and but they may not go as far and they only go in one direction. And also the state butterfly for Georgia, which is the tiger swallowtail, for example, it doesn't migrate. So it overwinters in the ground or somewhere like that as a chrysalis, um, and then it emerges in the spring as a butterfly. And so, this is the same for some other moths, um, like the oak beauty moth also overwinters in the ground as a caterpillar um, or a cocoon, and then it emerges in the spring as a moth. And that's another distinction between moths and butterflies. Butterflies emerge from chrysalides, which is the chrysalis, and moths emerge from cocoons. And so butterflies, the chrysalis is an internal process where um, the cocoon is made by an external process by spun silk. So emerging butterflies. So my family and I didn't do this, but we, um, you can consider tagging the monarch butterflies before releasing them so you can see where they go. And so the tag a monarch butterfly, if you're interested, uh, Monarch Watch is a great organization and they have, um, tagging kits that are available online and they also have a free mobile app where tagging um, and recovery data may be submitted. So if you're interested in um, tagging monarch butterflies, you can place the special sticker in the discal cell of the wing, which is the mitten shaped cell. And that way it doesn't harm the butterfly and it also makes it easier to notice when the butterfly's wings are closed. So 
then release. So my family and I, we release the monarch butterflies about four to 24 hours after they have um, had emerged. And that way they got stronger and um, could fly and be protected. And it was helpful to release one monarch butterfly at a time. So we opened the outdoor butterfly house and we released the monarch butterflies into the wild when it was really warm. So butterflies are most active when it's sunny, usually at 10 a.m and 2 p.m. And so we released them in the afternoon time. And we found that it was helpful to encourage the butterfly onto a flower and then taking it out from the outdoor butterfly house into the garden. And that way it was a safe way to release it. And we raised nine we raised and released nine monarch butterflies. And so there was a 100% success rate and six were females and three were males. So it was so incredible seeing them. And by the way, butterflies only have about a 1% survival rate in the wild. So my family and I tried to help them um, as naturally as possible. And these were the monarch butterflies we released. So you can see how they were flying onto trees and that was me releasing them. And then they're just so happy. And here are some more monarch butterflies. They're just so happy. And they were enjoying the sunshine and then meet the monarchs. So each butterfly had their own personality. So um, Autumn was the first butterfly to emerge and she was so sweet and shy. And she was named Autumn because she was born on the first day of fall. And then Amber was the second butterfly to emerge. And I named her Lovey because she gave sweet butterfly kisses. <laughs> and then Asher was the third butterfly. I nicknamed him Stinker because he tended to drop a lot of butterfly waste or meconium when he emerged. <laughs> and then... Sky was the fourth monarch butterfly to emerge, and I, I named him Sky because he had a unique, like, constellation of white specks on his abdomen. And then Sage was the fifth butterfly to emerge, and I named her that because she was, like, healthy and wise. And Rue was the sixth butterfly, and and so it was kind of funny and amazing how um, Sky, Sage, and Rue emerged at the same time, so there was so much excitement. And Zoe, Zoe was so special. She was the seventh butterfly to emerge, and she was truly a miracle. When she emerged as a butterfly, she was um, low on energy, and, and I also wasn't feeling well that day. But together we researched, and we got better, and and I gave her a fresh um, flower and she got nectar and she felt so much better then. And she gave sweet butterfly kisses as if to say thank you. And it was really amazing because I noticed that on a piece of board in the outdoor butterfly house, there was the word initiative. And it reminded me like this is an initiative, a monarch butterfly mission. And so I named Zoe that because Zoe means life and she was truly a blessing light and inspiration and she was so deeply transformative and she reminded me of how much butterflies are a reminder a legacy of hope faith and and determination Rory was the eighth butterfly to emerge and he was the last male monarch to be released and it means red king and he flew into the wind and explored his new kingdom and then soared off to conquer his new expedition. And then Journey was the ninth butterfly. And Journey was also very special because as a fifth and star caterpillar, she had escaped from the butterfly house. So we couldn't find her. And then one day when my mom was in the garden, she just found, happened to find a chrysalis on the underside of the patio chair. And behold, it was the lost monarch caterpillar's chrysalis. So it was a female chrysalis. So when the butterfly emerged, I named her Journey for her wandering spirit. So on the night, on the day she emerged, it was going to be um, below 55 degrees that night. And butterflies can't function well 
when it gets that cold. So because they're cold blooded and so they have to maintain um, their internal body temperature between 68 to 122 degrees Fahrenheit. So anyways, my family and I, we tried to um, hurry and make a temporary butterfly enclosure. So we used a mesh laundry bag and a plant container and we um, carefully placed um, Journey inside of that and she spent the night in the laundry room and and then the next morning we released her and she soared at the highest altitude of all the butterflies released beginning her great migratory voyage to Mexico. So invitation, raising monarchs at home from eggs to caterpillars to chrysalis into emerging butterflies is truly the most incredible, inspirational, and transformative experience. And getting to see the monarchs' life stages is so fascinating and humbling. Monarchs are precious blessings, survivors, and reminders that all of creation is interconnected and that growth and transformation is a process. And like monarchs, we are on a life journey and we all have a purpose. So let's continue the monarch's legacy by planting native milkweed and so lasting seeds of hope, spreading joy to all and protecting the monarchs. So community, how we can help the monarchs is by planting native milkweeds. These include like swamp milkweed and butterfly weed, and then also by creating native pollinator and wildlife gardens. And the host plants are milkweeds and the nectar plants like coneflowers, black-eyed Susans, and mountain mint. And the Maryland state butterfly, the Baltimore checker spot butterfly, its host plant is the white turtle head. And it likes dogbane and black-eyed Susans as nectar plants. So I thought that was really cool. And then also raising and releasing a few monarch butterflies in an outdoor butterfly garden habitat is really helpful. And participating in monarch citizen and community science, like monarch tagging through Monarch Watch and butterfly counts through the North American Butterfly Association. Also having other native trees in our yards um, provides shelter and shade for the butterflies as well and native trees uh, for the eastern United States include the tulip poplar and the flowering dogwood. And those are both host plants, host trees for um, the tiger swallowtail, the uh, tulip poplar tree. And then um, the flowering dogwood is a host tree for the spring and summer azure butterflies. So um, it's also um, great because those um, the flowering dogwood has berries on it so birds enjoy the berries. So some great Monarch resources are Monarch Watch, um, their tagging program, and then uh, Monarch Waystation Habitats, how we can create gardens for butterflies, and then Monarch Joint Venture and Journey North, which shows really great interactive migration maps. And then the North American Butterfly Association their um, butterfly counts. And then swamp milkweed seeds can be found online. A great brand that my family and I really like is called Outside Pride, and they have really great butterfly seeds. And then how to plant milkweed seeds, um, Monarch Joint Venture has some good instructions on that. And then swamp milkweed plants, nectar plants, and nursery containers can be found at local native plant nurseries. And if you're not sure, um, if your area has a native plant nursery, then perhaps um, your state can um, has a native plant society that may offer a listing of um, native nurseries in the area. And then the Stokes Butterfly Book um, is a great resource on gardening for butterflies, and that can be found on Amazon. And then butterfly houses, exhibits, and gardens are throughout um, the United States. And there is a great website that gives um, a, a national listing of all the butterflies throughout the US. And that website is called butterflywebsite.com. And they um, give great uh, resources on that. And a great butterfly house in Georgia, if you're ever visiting, is um, the Smith Gilbert Gardens and also Callaway Gardens. 
and Delonica Butterfly Farm. And then um, butterfly gardening ideas can be found at austinishia.com. Um, he has a great Better Homes and Gardens article. And then the North American Butterfly Association has great resources on butterfly gardening, as well as the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Insects. They have um, a monarch nectar plant guide available for different regions throughout the U.S. And then consulting with your um, your regional cooperative extension services. And then um, like for any soil test um, and soil amendments um, and also some great gardening resources there. And then Flight of the Butterflies is a wonderful monarch film. It was an IMAX film and it really brought the monarch's migration journey to life. It also discusses the um, research of the monarch biologist, Brad and Nora Urquhart and the monarch's amazing journey to Mexico. And then Wings in the Meadow by Joe Brewer is my favorite monarch book. And it's found on Amazon. And it was written in 1967, but it has scientific accuracy and it's beautifully written. And then also, if you like to see the monarchs overwearing in Mexico, there's a great monarch trip to Mexico available through Holbrook Travel. And it's offered every February for about five days in mid-February. And um, and you can visit the, the sanctuaries there. The largest uh, monarch sanctuary is called El Rosario. And that has... it. It reminds me of the videos online. It looks like thousands of monarchs are on the tree branches. It's amazing. And also, um, I've made a monarch life cycle bracelet. So this is like a great craft for kids. So I'll show you. This is um, this is like this white bead is the egg. Then the black bead is the um the part of the caterpillar and so is the yellow and white bead. And then the green bead is the chrysalis and the orange bead is the monarch butterfly. And then the green string is like milkweed, the host plant. So it's a great reminder of how to help monarchs. And also my book um, is called Journey with Monarchs. And if you're interested in it, um, please feel free to reach out to me by email. My email is B Beeler B E E L E R two like the number two at outlook.com. So B Beeler two at outlook.com. And it has some great photos and talks about the different life stages and gives like resources on how to help the butterflies. And I include all the butterflies I've noticed in our garden at home, as well as all the birds and other insects and animals so i try to tie it all together so thank you so much and this basically summarizes the four life stages of the monarch butterfly egg caterpillar chrysalis and butterfly any questions so did you take all those pictures yourself victoria I did, yes. Tell, tell me a little bit of what kind of camera you used. I'm just curious. So I actually used my iPhone camera. <laughs> so nothing fancy, just um, just my iPhone. And I really enjoyed raising and releasing the monarchs in the home garden with my family. It was so special seeing them the whole life stages. And I learned so much through it. I love your enthusiasm. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Questions? Awesome presentation, Victoria. <laughs> thank, thank, you. You. thank you for having me. Great job. We really appreciate you. Thank you so much. And by the way, uh, would you like to know how to say butterfly in sign language? Yes. Butterfly. Oh. So the caterpillar becomes a butterfly. And an egg in Spanish means huevo, caterpillar, oruga, chrysalis, chrysalida, and butterfly, mariposa. So go butterflies. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Any other questions on Zoom, anybody? Thank you, Victoria. Appreciate you. Take care. Thank you. Take care.